All right, so there's basically a couple of main points within this chapter that we're going to be dealing with tonight, as we just read through uh, chapter 6 here, 1 Corinthians. The first one dealing with judging and, and the way that uh, we should handle disputes within the church. And then the second thing dealing with sin and with specifically with fornication. So let's get started here looking at verse number 1. And really, we're kind of going to read the first six verses again. But I'll go through real briefly and give a little bit of a commentary on these verses. Verse number one, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. I like this very first verse because he's just starting off like, do you dare to even do that? And you, that, that word dare is kind of a strong word saying like, are you that bold? Are you so bold enough to take some dispute that you have between someone else in the church? That's where he says a matter that you have against someone else. You have a beef with somebody. You have an issue with someone else in the church. And are you that bold that you're, you're going to dare to take that matter outside of the church and just go and be judged by the heathen? Because that is not the way that we ought to deal with things. Now, Churches changed over years, and, and I don't know how many churches actually try to deal with things within the church, but this is the biblical model. And he's saying, you know what, when you have problems within the church, the church is its own authority given by God. Just as much as God has given authority to the family and God has given authority to human government, the church exists within its own scope of, of, of authority in people's lives. And he, what he's saying here is, you know, when matters happen within the church, you ought to be able to deal with them. Don't go to the law and, and fall under their jurisdiction. When, when you have problems with each other within the church, let the church deal with it. For one, it just makes sense. Of all things, when you're going to be judged by somebody else, don't you want to be judged by someone who has the light of God's word? illuminating them and giving them wisdom. I mean, what does a judge need more than just about anything else? They need to have wisdom. They need to, to not be corrupt. They need to be a, not a respecter of persons, but following all the wisdom. You know, someone I would way rather, if, if anything were ever to come up against me, I'd rather have a godly Christian being my judge to determine my guilt or my innocence or what's the right thing to do to make things correct in this situation than some heathen judge, than some unsaved, unregenerate person trying to make a decision on what's right and what's wrong. Because that's what a judge is doing. They're determining what's right and what's wrong. And he's saying, why in the world would you go before the unjust, before the unsaved world? Verse number two says, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? He's saying, Don't you know that God has already ordained that the, the, those, the saints are those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus? The people who are saved are going to judge the world. When Christ comes back, we will be ruling and reigning with Him on this earth. He's given us that job. He's saying, don't you even know that the saints are going to judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? I mean, we're not talking about judging the world or judging cities in the situation he's bringing up here. He's saying we're talking about judging you know, individual matters amongst yourself. He's saying, if you're going to have this such a responsibility in the future, you can't even take care of the little things now. And see, unfortunately, a lot of people are conditioned, especially these days, into thinking that, well, if someone steals from me or if something happens to someone in church or if someone hits my property out in the parking lot or whatever, if I have, for, for any reason comes up that I have an issue or a matter with someone else in the church, they're going to say, well, that's what the court system's for. That's what the legal system's for. No, it's not. It's not for you within, within the, the body of Christ here, within the local church, to take those matters outside of the church. Let's keep reading. He says in verse 3, Know ye not that we shall judge angels. So again, he's emphasizing the, the role that we're going to have. He said, we're going to be judging the angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? You know, people get caught up with this nonsense of a judge. No, nah, oh, you can't judge. Judge, judge, you know, not judge, don't judge. You can't judge anybody. You can't judge anything. And they get so off on, on that, that way of thinking 
that a concept like this would be foreign to him. I wonder what those people even do with this chapter. When he's telling you, look, you're going to be judges of the angels. You're going to be judging the world. You can't judge the smallest of matters. But this is how he's ordained things to be. Within the church, we ought to be able to judge these things. We ought to have the basic knowledge of right and wrong and have the wisdom of God to be able to be a just judge in these types of matters. He says in verse 4, If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, here's what you do. If you have something that needs a judgment over it, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? He's saying, isn't there somebody in there that's, that's humble? They're not, they're not, they don't have all the self-esteem, right? They're least esteemed. They're able to know right from wrong. They have wisdom, right? They're not, they're not corrupt. They don't, they're not bought. They're not in somebody's pocket, right? Where um, they're just... given to accepting favors. And, you know, the Bible talks a lot about what a just judge should be like. You know, you shouldn't, a judge doesn't accept gifts because that's going to make you partial in your judgment. It's going to make you more partial to someone who's, who's giving you all these favors. Um, so he's saying, and then he says in verse 5, I speak to your shame. Is, is, is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. He's saying in your whole church, don't you have somebody that's wise? Don't you have somebody that you can trust to judge over these matters? He says in verse 6, But brother goeth to law with brother in that before the unbelievers. He's saying you've got saved brothers in Christ going to the unbelievers for their judgment to guide them and to give them what's right and true instead of the church judging. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 18. This is the exact same principle that Jesus Christ himself taught. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, look at verse number 15. Jesus said, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So these are the steps that Jesus is telling us when you have a problem with somebody. Because let's, now, you know, obviously right now our church is really small. We haven't had any problems with any church members in the, in the two years of our existence. But as we grow, and I know God's going to bless our church, and I know we're going to grow, we'll get more people in here. And as you get just more people around each other, there will probably end up being a time where there's a conflict between people. Not everybody's personalities get along, and sometimes, you know, people end up doing wrong things to other people, even Christians. Now, obviously it's not something we should be doing, but it happens. It's reality. It's the world that we live in. And he's saying, okay, look. If your brother sins against you, as you said, if someone trespasses against you, if, if your brother in Christ does you wrong, right? Which means you are completely justified. Someone does you wrong. Maybe someone steals from you or someone damages your property. You, would, you, you didn't do anything wrong. You're going to be looking for compensation or whatever it is to make it right. He says the first thing you need to do is just go talk to that person. And unfortunately, we live, we live in a, in a scaredy-cat society today where people do not have the guts to just go up and talk to somebody. And if, we could, if people would just start doing that, so many problems would be solved right away. Now, that doesn't always work. And he gives a whole chain of command here of things that we need to do in order to, to resolve problems. But the very first step, and if you ever have a problem with anyone in church... If someone says something you don't like, if someone posts something on Facebook that's offensive to you and you are holding something against someone else, you know, you ought not to have that spirit of, of bitterness against someone else in the church. We all ought to be unified in the faith and love one another. And if there's something that someone says or something does, the first thing you need to do is just go to that person and try to deal with the problem with them individually. That's what Jesus is saying is the first step. But look at verse 16. He says, but if he will not hear thee, okay, they're, they, they're not, it's not working out, right? You're not coming to an agreement, to a resolution, your problem. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. 
that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So he says, okay, now it's time to include a couple more people. Because, you know, there's always this he said, she said stuff going on when people have issues. But when you have two or three witnesses, you can establish the word so that you have people saying, oh, no, this is exactly what happened. And you can have an agreement there. And it's not just one person's word over another. So you go and you sit down and you talk to that person again, except now you've got witnesses. So you could say, okay, here's the facts. And you could, you could dispute the facts between each other. And the witnesses can be there. And they can also be there to help judge and hear what's going on. And it, it, could be, it could still be a small matter that can be settled you know, relatively easily. If it's not easily settled between the two of you, you get a, get a few more people together. They can help determine a righteous judgment. Right? They could hear the whole matter and establish the words. But then it says in verse 17, And if he shall neglect to hear them, talking about the, the witnesses that you, that you brought forth to hear your whole matter between the two of you, tell it unto the church. So there comes a point then where if the resolution is not being solved, we're going to say, okay, we're going to bring this in front of everybody. Because the church needs to deal with these problems. When you have issues between people, we're supposed to be unified within the church. And it can ultimately come up unto a church decision. But then it says, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. What Jesus is teaching here, and get this, he's teaching that whatever the church decides as the final judgment in a matter that comes between people, that's the way where it should stand and that's where it should rest. And you say, if, if a person's not willing to accept the judgment because maybe it didn't go in their favor, right? And they just say, no, you know, they can't resolve it between themselves. They can't resolve it when you get a few other people involved. And then they just refuse to accept the judgment that the church gives. He says, let them be unto you as a heathen and a publican. He said, fine, just have nothing to do with them then. But at no point does he say, well, then at that point, you can take them to court, you know, within the outside of the church. He says the church has the final say in these matters within the church and between people um, that are here. Now, there are issues, there are situations where given the, the, the world we live in today and the authority that's been in some ways usurped over the church and the way the, the law of the land work, there are some things where the church is not going to deal with the issues. For example, if there's someone commits a crime that's going to be worthy of like the death penalty, that is not a matter that the church is going to be able to solve because the punishment that needs to be meted out is not, we do not have the authority to act upon those types of judgments. This is really dealing with matters of just individual people just doing, someone did wrong to you, you know, whether it be theft or property damage, or something like that. These are all the smaller matters. And you could kind of gain that from the reading anyways. You know, because it's, some, it's something that you can deal with that, hey, you know, you did wrong to me in this sense or in that sense. It's not like a rape or a murder or, or something, um, you know, extremely criminal like that. But property damage, these types of things, you don't need to be taking your, your brother or sister. And, and we'll, get, we'll get to that in a minute here too. Look at... Uh, well, I'll read for you. We already read the chapter anyways. Verses 7 and 8 of 1 Corinthians 6. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 5 because we're going to look at that again. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7 says, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law one with another. And now he brings up another aspect. He's saying, first, you know, you should be dealing with these things within the church. This is the way that Jesus Christ himself even ordained that it should be done, is that you should be able to deal with all these personal matters within yourself. Don't go out to the heathen. And by the way, this is the way that we'll deal with things in here too. And you ought to, everyone in this church ought to be willing to submit themselves to the authority of, of Scripture, first and foremost, and the way that Scripture outlines dealing with these things. So hopefully everybody will deal with their issues by going to the person first and just try to deal with them that way. And if it's a real big problem and you guys can't resolve it, you, you, you follow the steps that are outlined here. 
And you ought to be humble enough to be able to say, even if something doesn't work out the way that you, that you think it should and that you think is right, if the whole church is saying, no, this is the judgment that we see fit, this is what needs to happen, then you ought to be able to fall in line with that. Because the authority has been given by Jesus Christ himself to have that authority over these types of matters. He says, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And it's in this exact context of dealing with these issues within the church. But he says there's another side to this. So that it shouldn't even have to come to this point where you have to even bring everything up before the church. Look at verse, well, in verse number 7, he says, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? He said, when someone does you wrong, why don't you just take it? Instead of making a big deal out of it, and having to make, it, make sure it gets right, you know, that wrong is, is made right, and that there's a judgment, and that people can rule in your favor, instead of doing all of that, he said, why don't you just take the wrong? Someone does you wrong, why don't you just take it? Which is to say, fine. Someone damages your property, you say, why don't you just say, forget about it. And have that type of an attitude. He says, why do you, why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? What does it mean to be defrauded? It means you're tricked, right? Someone, someone has gone and tricked you out and, and, and committed fraud against you. He says, why don't you just allow that to happen? You know what? Go ahead. Verse 8, nay, ye do wrong and defraud in that your brethren. He's like, and you guys are doing it to each other. Your own brothers and sisters in Christ. It, it's like, I mean, and seriously, doing something like that to your brothers and sisters in Christ is like doing something like that to your own flesh and blood. I mean, can you imagine stealing, defrauding your own family? I mean, your own, your own physical brother or sister or your mother or your father and just, you know, doing these types of crimes against them and not caring about it. He's like, that's what's happening within the church, yet your brothers and sisters in Christ. Matthew 5, now I just preached on this when I, uh, I preached on Sunday night, but um, just look at Matthew 5, 38. We'll go over this again because it's, it's the same concept that we need to understand of, of a humble concept and one that will help to reduce strife and conflict and, um, you know, an attitude and a spirit that we ought to have as Christians, especially within the church. Because think about it, and, and, and this is kind of important too. You know, we, we have, uh, you know, the church, there, there's a main focus and a goal to go out and bring the gospel to the lost and to help teach people and to train them to lead godly lives to get the sin out of their lives and to live a way that's pleasing to God and to be there to help other brothers and sisters out. I mean, this is what the church is about. This is, this is the main focus and the goal. When we have these other issues that come up and we have these conflicts within the church and, and people divided against each other, what can happen is you could start getting factions of people who, oh, I think this person's right, I think that person's right, and it could build into something that it never should in the first place. And then you could say, okay, well, it's going to come be be before the church, and then if you know, one party doesn't agree with what the church decides, then all of a sudden you could get this big split, and now what's happened you have a major problem in the, in the church, especially in being able to go and do the job that it's supposed to be doing in the first place. And he's saying before it ever even gets to that point and gets that bad, why don't you just suffer yourself to be defrauded? You know, Why don't you just, just let these things happen? You don't have to take it up. Now, he's not saying you're, you're absolutely wrong. If someone does you wrong and, and, you, and, you, and you go to them or you bring it before other people and looking for a judgment, he doesn't say that's sinful or wrong. He's just saying, well, look, why don't you just be the bigger person and just say, fine. You know, if someone steals from you, well, apparently you need it more than I do. You know, don't take offense to it, just whatever. You know, he's saying that's the type of attitude we ought to have. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Matthew 5, verse 38, the Bible reads, you have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Right? And this is talking about judgment and justice, right? Getting the right judgment. Say, oh, someone, someone pokes your eye out, they need to get their, their eye poked out, whatever. You know, it's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Everything that someone does to you, uh, the, the, the proper balances of justice, the scale, needs to be met appropriately. 
And that's justice. He's saying, you've heard that said before, an eye for an eye for a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So if someone, if someone wants to take you to court and they, and they, and they, you know, they, they take your, your cloak, right? Which I know we don't really wear cloaks, but he's saying, you know, you take your jacket, let him have your coat also, whatever. He says, um, go ahead, you know, just, just take it all, whatever. Because, you don't, for one, you don't care about the material possession anyway. That's not where your, your big hang-up is. But he's just saying, go ahead, just, just let him do it. Let him do it because ultimately we don't have to seek out the justice for ourselves in our lives. We can rely on God to be the ultimate judge in matters and the things that happen in our life. And he can bless us at any moment. And, if, and, and he sees, I mean, think about it. If someone were to come in tonight while we're at church and rob my house and take all of my stuff and leave me with nothing, do you think God's not going to see what's happening? And it could require a lot of faith, but I can, you know, we ought to be able to trust that, you know what, God will right that wrong. That person that's sowing wickedness by doing that, they'll reap what they've sown, believe it. And if I decide to get involved and try to make things right on my own, well, then God might look at that and be like, okay, well, I guess he didn't want me to be the, to be the, the, the one giving justice here and might not even get involved with that and just saying, okay, well, I guess whatever you're doing, you think that's good enough. God knows what's best and what's right for people and the right uh, justice that needs to be served. So he's saying, if it happens to you, fine. That's not the fight that we need to fight. He says in verse 41, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This is the type of attitude that we need to have. He says that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. This is that Christ-like spirit that we ought to strive to have within ourselves. Flip back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Excuse me. So the judgment, any, any problems that you have, and keep this in mind. And if you have any issues with somebody, you can bring it to me and ask me my advice. But the, the first piece of advice is always going to be, go and settle that with that person. Just try to, try to come to, a, to an agreement that works for both of you. When someone, if someone does you wrong, someone breaks something that you have. I mean, I remember this happened to us. I mean, we, we, lend, we lend something out to a... To a family and church and they brought it back to us broken right now that's not right we didn't do anything wrong we would have been justified in in saying no you broke this you know we don't have a lot of money you broke this you need to fix this this is something that we use this is something that that we we need or whatever and there would have been nothing wrong with that like it wouldn't it wouldn't have been a sin to do that we could have approached them first and just said, hey, what well, you know, you guys broke this. What are you going to do about this? We, you know, and, and when you have a problem with someone, that's the way you do it if you can't get over it, right? But the first step should just be like, and this is what we ended up doing is just saying, well, forget about it. You know what? Forget about it. And we're not going to, you know, have a grudge against the, that family. Because if you're, if you're going to have a grudge, if you're going to say, well, I won't do anything about it, but then hold a grudge, that's even worse, and if, and if you can't be able to let things go like that, then it's better just to bring it up to them and say, well, let's just resolve this because I'm having too hard of a time letting this thing go. Or maybe, you know, in, in our situation, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty minor thing. It really isn't like, I mean, we're not talking about like thousands of dollars worth of damage or something that's like, could have been a real significant hit to us, right? Where, where you know, maybe someone crashes into your car in a parking lot and we have one vehicle and like, what am I going to do now? Right, like, like what, 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 I have no means of transportation, and I don't have any money to go out and buy a new one. You know, I would like to just let this thing go, but we need to make this work. You know, I mean, there's there's all kinds of different situations that you may have. The best way to deal with it, I think, and what I think what the Bible's teaching here is that if you can just say, forget about it, you know, don't worry about it, forgive that person, move on, then all the it's all the better. 
Suffer yourself to be, to be wronged. Suffer yourself to have those bad things happen and just move forward. And you know what? God will bless you for that. God will see what happens. But if, if it's something for whatever reason you just, you, that's not a, a good option for you, you can't do that, and then you need to just go through the, the protocol here of going to the person, bring, it to a few, you know, bring a few witnesses around, and then bring the matter before the church. So let's keep reading here. Let's see what else we've got in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse number 9, he continues, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, there's a few things I want to touch and preach on these, these verses right here. For one, this is a verse that, that people might turn to to try to justify a works-based salvation. Right? I'll try to tell you, see, look, if you do any of these things, then you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You're not saved. This is the people who believe you can either lose your salvation or they believe you have to do works to be saved. And watch out for this type of stuff because they always want to rip it out of context. Because what does it do? It lists off sins. They're saying, see, look, you can't fornicate or you can't be a drunk. You can't drink and still be saved. And this is, this is be the, the passage that they turn to. But what they'll fail to do is read the very next verse. Let's read verse number 11. The Bible says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So what, what is the reason? Because he says, Such were some of you. You used to be an idolater, a fornicator, whatever, all these things. The reason why they are not anymore is simply because they have been washed by the blood of Christ. Now, even if they were to still continue drinking or whatever, that will not change the fact that they have been washed and sanctified by the blood of Christ. That does not mean that they are... Um, no longer saved. What he's pointing out here is that, you know, unless you do get forgiven of your sins through Jesus Christ, all of the sins that you've committed are still there. You're still responsible for them. You are still going to be held accountable for them, which is why uh, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. So, if in God's eyes you still are a fornicator, idolater, or covetous, or, or any of these things, right? that are worthy of, of hell. It's because he doesn't recognize that you've been washed by Jesus Christ. It's because you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior. Once you do that, God doesn't see you as an idolater, as a fornicator, as all of these things, because you've been washed of that. It's, your, your slate has been wiped clean. And that's what he's saying. He explains this very easily and very simply. This isn't teaching a works-based salvation, even, not even close to it. But he's also making a point here because this is tied right in with judgment, right? With us judging matters. And he's saying, look, don't you know that the unrighteous... And remember, we just read in the last chapter the sins that people can do in order to be breaking fellowship with, not to even sit down and eat with these people. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but in that chapter 5, all of the sins that are mentioned there are, are reiterated again here. So in chapter 5, it talks about people not to even, not to even uh, sit down and eat with. It mentions, look at here, verse 6, it says the fornicators. Fornication is mentioned in chapter 5. Idolaters, idolaters is mentioned in chapter 5. This says adulterers, but I mean, if you got fornicators already, ad adultery is just a, little, is a worse situation with, with fornication, right? So it would make, it only makes sense that adulterers would be included in chapter 5 also. It's just not specifically laid out, but it would, it would make sense. Now this has effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind, not included in chapter 5. Uh, thieves, not mentioned in chapter 5, but then covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, all of those things were mentioned in chapter 5 also. As really bad sins that if a brother's doing these things, you just need to break fellowship with them. And these are sins that can be brought forth before the church too. If someone you know, finds out, hey man, there's, a, there's someone in our church 
that's an idolater or a drunkard or a fornicator, you go to that person and, you know, be a judge in that manner. And that may be something where the whole church has to get involved in a judgment. And then they, they, can, they can treat the matter as just, you know, they're like a heathen man. But another point I want to bring up about these verses is that this is also a place that, that people will turn to to try to say, see, sodomites can be saved. And we believe, I believe from Romans chapter 1 and what this church teaches and believes is that there are people in this world that are called reprobates. And I'm going to be going, I'm, probably this Sunday or very, very soon, I'm going to be doing another sermon just, just giving a whole outline on this. But just real briefly, Romans 1 teaches there are people that are given up on by God. They have been given over to a reprobate mind. Their heart has been hardened and darkened and they become wise in their own imaginations. Their foolish heart is darkened. God's given them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, the Bible says. And as a result of God rejecting them, they, start, they are basically given over to do whatever sins they can. And Romans 1 lists all kinds of attributes right at the end of all the sins that these people will do. And what those sins are is their symptoms that they show the fact that they're not saved. And the big one that's in that list that comes up over and over again is that, you know, even their women to change their natural use into that which is against nature. And their men, um, men with men, you know, they burn in their lust one towards another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. These are attributes of someone who has already been given over by God unto these vile, wicked, gross, disgusting affections towards each other. And it's not that those, it's not that committing the sin of a man lying with a mankind is what makes the person rejected. Too many people have this concept where they think, oh, so if someone, just because someone broke that one law that's laid out in Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 20, they'll say, well, a man laid with mankind, it does, you know, what, why is it that all of a sudden he can't be saved anymore? It, but it's not because he committed that sin that makes him unsavable. It's not a, a, um, a result of that sin. That sin is a result of them being already rejected. That's where the, that's the, the part that I think people have a hard time grasping, is that no person would commit that type of an act unless they were already rejected by God and given over unto that type of a reprobate mind. Because it's something that's even against nature. See, we have a sinful nature. We have a, we have a nature to steal, to lie, to fornicate, to get drunk, right? To do all of these various things, to defraud people. That's part of our sinful nature. It's, it's not against our nature, our physical nature to do those things. But what is against the physical nature that God's given us is for a man to lie with a man or a woman to lie with a woman. That is against the, the physical nature of things. Now, again, I also don't believe that just because someone may have participated in an act like that at one point in their life, that that automatically makes them a sodomite. A sodomite someone who's burned in their lust one toward another. I mean, that's, the, that's what the Bible is defining there in Romans chapter 1. People who have, you know, forsaken the natural use of the man and commit those things that are against nature, you know, women with women. Or the men forsaking the natural use of the woman and, and you know, men with men and being burned in their lust towards each other. Like, that's a sodomite. That's someone who is reprobate. But some girl somewhere that, you know, got drunk and, and kissed some other girl in a bar or something, I'm not saying that, that, that every single person who's ever done anything even close to that is considered a reprobate. So there is a difference there, but I'm not going to spell out and draw some line of, well, if you've done this and this and this. No, it's, if, if someone's burned in their lust towards the same sex, they're given over to the reprobate mind and they're rejected. 
But what people will do then is they'll turn to this verse, this, this portion of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Because it lists off all these sins, and he says, and such were some of you. So he says, obviously, they say, well, see, look, and, and what's included in these sins, it's, you know, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers. And then it says, effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, first of all, that word effeminate, that does not mean homosexual. Effeminate, first of all, it is, just notice, it is a sin for a man to be effeminate. What does effeminate mean? It means feminine. It means like, you're acting like a woman. So, when you see the, the, the youth these days, and they think it's so cool to be these metrosexuals, or whatever you want to call them, and you got these guys talking with lisps, and they're kind of flaming, and they got these limp wrists, even if they're not a homo, that's a sin. Even if they're not a sodomite, hey, that's wrong. When you're talking like a little queer, when you're being effeminate, when, when all of your likes and your tastes and everything is more like a woman than a man. That's a sin. That's being effeminate. But that word effeminate, that doesn't mean that you're a sodomite, first of all. But then it's the second one, though, that people will really cling to and say, well, no, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, the translators could have used the word sodomite. They could have used you know, other words. They chose this word to, def to, to give us the, the definition of what they're talking about. It's not clear, first of all, in my mind, that this is saying that that's a sodomite, an abuser of themselves with mankind. A few different things can come to mind about this. And, and you know what? Maybe it is of a, of a sexual nature. Maybe it is something like that. I don't know, but if the Bible doesn't come out and say sodomite, and you know, a lot of people will like to go back to the Greek and try to tell you what all these words mean in the Greek and stuff, but we have the English, and the English says abusers of themselves with mankind. That does not sound like someone who's given over to reprobate mind to me. Because people will look at that and say, see, look, this is showing you that, that a sodomite can be saved because he says, and such were some of you. So if he's saying that, well, some of you were, were sodomites, but now you're washed. That's kind of the point that they're trying to make with this. I don't believe that to be true. I don't think abusers of themselves with mankind is talking about a sodomite. But even if it did, even if we go as far to say that abusers of themselves with mankind, he says, and such were some of you. So, and such just means you know, there's all these, he lists off a whole bunch of sins. It does, he's not saying that they were all, or any of them were specifically a fornicator or specifically an idolater. He lists off all these things, and such just means, and other sins like this, right? And such, and of all these types of sin, all these various sins were some of you, but you're washed. You are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So no, I do not think that this teaches that a, that a, a full-blown sodomite can just be saved. I don't think that this is that it's, it's referring to that. I mean, abusers themselves with mankind can be talking about maybe someone who did get involved in a situation. Maybe they were defiled as a child. Maybe they, you know, got drunk and, and was in a situation that they were kind of not even knowing really a whole lot what's going on or whatever. And it is a sin and, and, it's, and it could have been disgusting or whatever. But... They didn't, um, and it says here, abusers of themselves, you know? It doesn't say they're abusers of, like, abusing someone else. It's abusing themselves with mankind. So it kind of leads a little bit to, want, you know, exactly what is this talking about. But when you have clear scriptures, like in Romans chapter 1, and talking about where God hardens heart, and when you see the story of Pharaoh, and, um, you know, all these other very clear scriptures, that refer to someone who is rejected or a child of the devil, or a child of Satan, right? That, uh, or the false prophets in Jude. When you read all that clear scripture, there's not a contradiction in the Bible, and I don't believe that. But let's keep reading here. It says in verse number 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. He 
He just got done saying that, you know, you, you know, such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by, by the Spirit of our God. So because we are washed through the blood of Jesus Christ, all of our sins are forgiven, what he's saying is that, well, all things are lawful unto me. I could basically do whatever I want because I've already been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't make it right. That's what he says, but all things are not expedient. It's not what I should be doing. It's not, that's not something that's going to get me to my goal and, 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 and fulfill the purpose that I have here. But I am no longer under that law because grace has abounded and covered. Anywhere where the law goes, grace is so much more abounded and covers my sin. So even when I continue to sin, yes, grace abounds even more. And this is what he's teaching here. All things are lawful unto me. He says, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Even though it's lawful, he said, it's still, you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to be brought in the bondage of sin. I don't want to be um, controlled in that way. Verse 13, let's we're going to close with the last main point of this, uh, of this chapter here. Verse 13 Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And kids, I want you to pay special attention to this. I know you're really young now, but this is really important to understand this concept from a young age. There's a sin called fornication that is committed when a man and a woman come together, except they're not married. See, what God teaches is that in order for a man and a woman to come together and become one flesh, you need to be married. And that's, that's where we have families and, and when children are born unto families, it's because of the, the, the man and the woman coming together and being one flesh. When, you, when people want to do that and they want to live a life like they're married, but they're not really married, the Bible calls that fornication. And fornication is a very, very, very serious sin. God does not like the fornication. And He will bring judgment upon you if you decide to do this act with another, with a, with another person. And the Bible's teaching us here, He says, the body is not for fornication. That's not why God has given us His body. Our body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Verse 14, And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by His power. Our body belongs to God. He's saying our body is going to be raised up. Just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, our bodies are going to be raised up too. Know ye not, verse 15, that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. He's saying that we, our bodies are basically like a part or a member of the body of Christ. Our own physical bodies. So he's saying, are we going to take our bodies, which is a part of Christ's body, and make that members with a harlot, make that one with a harlot, and just go and lie with a, with a hooker, with a, with a whore or a whoremonger. Take something so holy like the body of Christ and defile it with something so wicked. He says, God forbid, verse 16, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. He's saying you become one with that person. You become one flesh with that person. So if you're taking the member of Christ and making that the member of a harlot, you're making that one. Verse 17, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And we have been joined unto the Lord. When you're saved, you're born again. You have the new spirit born inside of you. You have eternal life residing inside of you. You're joined with the Lord in one spirit. Verse 18, Flee fornication. What does it mean to flee? It means to run away really fast and just get as far as you say. If you're fleeing something, you're going full speed the other direction. So fornication's coming your way. He says, get as far away as that, from that as possible. And how could fornication be coming your way? Well, you start having a relationship with somebody that you're not married to, and you start allowing provision for the flesh, and you get yourself into situations where maybe you're alone with someone, 
and there's opportunities for this to rise. If you're fleeing fornication, you will not allow for any of that to happen. That's why, kids, it's important before you get married to somebody, when you do start dating, when you do start getting interested in, in boys or men, um, that you will be always only meeting with them in a public place, in a place where it's not possible for the fornication to even happen, where there's an adult around, or there's a parent around, somebody around to make sure that that's not going to happen. That's one of the ways you can flee fornication. You can make sure that it's not going to happen at all. But when you get yourself alone and you, in, you get yourself alone in a bedroom with someone that, um, that you're not married to, then you are not fleeing fornication. You're going to be allowing for something like that to possibly happen. The Bible says, Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. He's making a point here to make a distinction that, you know what, there's a lot of sins in this world that we can do. But this, the sin of fornication is something you do against your own body. He says, verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The moment you get saved, the Holy Ghost makes its home inside of your body. Right now, every, every believer in Christ, the Holy Ghost is residing within those people. So our body has become the dwelling place for the Holy Ghost. It's a house. It's a, it's a place for the Holy Ghost to reside and to live. And he's saying, if that's the, if that's the case then how in the world can you be taking the temple, the holy temple, the temple of the Holy Ghost, and defiling that by committing fornication with somebody? We need to have the proper view of sin and the, and the proper way of thinking about things. And don't let this world deceive you because the music out there will tell you, oh, it's love. And it's so great and wonderful to sleep around and commit fornication when it's not love to... to to give yourself, to give your body to somebody that has not been given in marriage and to go against what the Lord says and to, and to take the member of Christ and make them the member of an harlot. We belong to God. We belong, our, our body and our soul and our spirit have all been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's redeemed us. He's bought us. He's purchased us. We belong to Him and we ought to have respect for that and treat our bodies in a way that will be pleasing unto God since they belong unto Him. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for these great words and these great truths that You have for us, dear Lord, in the Bible. I pray that You would please help us to deal with any matters and any situations that, that arise, any strife or, or problems that, that might come between um, church members, that we can deal with them in a biblical way, dear Lord, that, um, that we wouldn't go to the heathen or the unbeliever for judgment, but that we could trust in the judgment of the church. And I pray that You would please help us to have the proper spirit about us to be able to just suffer wrong when things come our way and not even have to make an issue out of things, dear Lord. We pray also that you would help us to understand your words and your teachings and um, help us to avoid fornication and flee from it, dear God, and to um, not have anything to do and not get anywhere close. Those that are married, to avoid the adultery. And for those that are not married yet, dear God, I pray that you please help them to keep their, their virgin and their integrity, dear Lord, that they could understand what a, what a great gift it will be to, to be virgin and give themselves only unto one person in their entire life um, if they when they get married, dear Lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.